Hey guys, Chad here with the Reptile Rangers. Now check this out. I've got an absolutely awesome little reptile with us today. We have the Bearded Dragon, all right? Now, the Bearded Dragon, we're going to go over housing and diet and uh, captive care of the Bearded Dragon in this particular segment, okay? Uh, but the Bearded Dragon, one of the best lizard pets that's out there on the planet. These animals are absolutely amazing. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They are a great little companion pet. Uh, they hang out on your shoulders and hang out on couches and computers and things like that for hours and hours and hours. Uh, they do make an absolutely wonderful, wonderful pet. So let's go over this uh, wonderful reptile today. We're going to go over the Bearded Dragon Captive Care as a pet. Okay, so we're here at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo. Let's get started. First thing we're going to talk about when it comes to the bearded dragon is let's just talk about simply choosing a dragon, okay? Now, there are a lot of people that breed bearded dragons. There's a lot of wholesale companies that sell bearded dragons, whether they breed them, whether they bought them from somebody else that's bred, um, and they're turning around and reselling them wholesale. Um, babies versus adults. Babies are absolutely awesome. They are, but depending on where you get the baby from, you can end up with a lot of headaches. A lot of your major pet chains, a lot of your wholesale industries, uh, things like that. They're just, unfortunately, not quality bred animals. Uh, they're not captive bred, they're not selectively bred, they're not quality bred, and they can cause a lot of health problems. I'm not gonna go over all the health problems realistically in this particular video. That would be a whole other video, okay? Talking about things such as adenovirus and bearded dragons, which is a fatal, 100% fatal disease. Um, and it's uh, not curable, okay? So that's that's one thing. But I'm not gonna talk about all of the issues inside of Bearded Dragons in this one. We just wanna talk about captive care and how to keep them, what to feed them, uh, things like that, okay? So again, number one is just making your selection. Do you go with a baby? Do you go with an adult? Now, there's many, many reasons why you might wanna go with a baby. It's small, it's cute, you can grow with it, it can grow with you, it can grow with your child. Um, they can watch it grow up, um, you can watch it nourish, uh, but, there are adults as well. And adults can be adults anywhere from 10 to 15 months. They can be a decent size already, so they're still young, okay, and can be already established. <clears throat> There's benefits to having one that's already established. It's an adult, uh, meaning it already eats exactly what it should be eating. It's gotten past a lot of the genetic issues that may come to light uh, as a uh, youngster or a, uh, a juvenile uh, that may cause it problems. Um, it's gotten past most of those uh, that we would see come up as a medical center uh, when they're very, very young. Um, but as an adult, they've gotten past that, okay? They're usually a whole lot more laid back as an adult, um, as babies. They're kind of wired up, they're exploratory, they're nosy, and of course they want to go explore their habitat. Uh, with the adults, they're still nosy, but they're a whole lot more laid back. I mean, you can see, I'm sitting here, I'm talking, I'm, you know, I'm going through this video, and this animal right here is just sitting here hanging out with me. These, the adults are great, uh, but I'm not gonna tell you one versus the other. I like the adults, they're laid back. I also like the babies, they're kind of cute, um, and, and you can grow them up, okay? Now, let's talk about habitat. Selecting your habitat, there's several different things that you can do, and I'm going to tell you, we, we go over this every single video, there's going to be forums, there's going to be groups, there's going to be uh, Facebook, there's going to be Google, there's going to be all kinds of different things that's going to tell you a million different things and a million different opinions. One of the biggest kickers right now is don't keep them on sand because they have no business on sand. Well, what in the world do you think they're on in the desert? They're on sand. So get that stupidity right out of the, right out of the market. Now. One of the things we're going to talk about when it comes to sand is, yes, sand, any kind of a bedding medium can cause impaction if it's done improperly or they, um, they're not on it in the correct kind of a way. But the thing is, is you have to understand these animals are not stupid. Uh, they're not just out there blatantly eating sand just because it's there. No, um, that's, that's not the way that this works. Uh, you can keep them on things like tile, you can keep them on uh, rocks, you can keep them on sand, which is a natural median anyways. Um, but decorating your habitat uh, is going to be essential. 
Um, so when we're talking about habitats, let's talk about this. The minimum, minimum requirement should be a 40 breeder or a 55 long aquarium. That's minimum, okay? You can go as much as 75, 125, uh, 175, 150 gallon. You can do jewelry display cases, these big, nice, massive double door with a glass in the back. I've seen many of them done. I mean, you can get creative. You can even uh, turn long, massive coffee tables into, you know, wh whatever, as long as the animal is going to have a essentially what it needs. Room to move, room to, to be itself, a warm end, a cool end. And remember, it's a desert, desert habitat, so it's going to be warm and dry all over anyways, and we'll talk about temperatures here in a few minutes. But when selecting your habitat, they don't need as much height like an iguana would or something that's considered a boral or a climbing lizard, but they do like to climb. So give them some height, okay? Give them some room to be able to climb and exercise, but be able to have length of, of tank uh, so that it can go from one end to the other. Now, when we start talking habitat, we've talked 40 breeder, 55 long, you can do 75 gallon, you can do 125, so on and so forth. In decorating your habitat, that is totally up to you how you decorate it. Um, you can put in rocky outcrops, you can put in the, I mean, all different kinds of things, a little cactus, fake cactus plants. You can do whatever you want to do as far as decoration, but you do want to give actual depth and sustenance to your actual habitat. It gives clarity to it. It makes it feel like a natural habitat. It makes it feel like home for these animals, okay? <clears throat> How you decorate it and exactly what form you decorate it, that's up to each individual person. There is no right or wrong, essentially, when it comes to decorations, as long as it's not something that's going to be harmful for the animal, something that may uh, fall on it if it's not in there in the right way, it falls on it and it crushes it, uh, or it's able to get out of the habitat, or uh, you know any number of reasons, something that it can it can uh, impale itself on or whatever. So you just got to make sure that it's not something that it can get injured by. Uh, but how you decorate it literally is totally up to you. Okay, um, let's talk about let's talk about diet. Okay. When, well, let's, I'll tell you what, let's go back, let's talk about lighting. When we're talking about the habitat, let's talk about lighting. Reptiles, I know we, we did the episode on MBD, you need to check that episode out. Um, I go a little bit deeper into the UVB, calcium, and all that kind of good stuff in that particular episode. Uh, but when we start talking lighting, you need two different types of light, okay? You need a light for heat, um, and you need a light for UVB. Could be a mercury vapor bulb, could be a... Uh, ultraviolet uh, light that's an incandescent tubed bulb. Um, it could be one of these, what we call a curly Q bulb, looks like one of the new energy saver bulbs. Those are ultraviolet light, but you gotta make sure it says ultraviolet light, all right? And these guys require what's known as either a full spectrum, desert, or like a 10.0, okay? Any of those three is considered a deserty style ultraviolet light bulb. <clears throat> now, With your heat bulb, the heat bulb is just essentially for producing light and heat, okay? You can use a ceramic heat emitter. It doesn't even have to produce light as long as it produces heat and you still got the light coming from your UVB bulb. Heat is essential with these animals with any kind of a reptile for digestion, for processing food, uh, for having an appetite. Um, heat is essential for a lot of different, a lot of different issues, okay? Um, and a lot of different things that these animals need. Now, with the ultraviolet light bulb, that gives them the vitamin D3 that they need uh, so that their bones and their bodies grow like they're supposed to. Okay, so you need those two lights. You don't necessarily have to go to a pet store to get a heat bulb, okay? Uh, just because it says uh, one of these manufacturers, another, and I'm not gonna promote one or the other because none of them are doing any kind of, uh, any kind of sponsorship through us, so I don't care who you use. If you wanna go to Walmart and use an old incandescent bulb, go for it. Um, I have no obligation to tell you to go buy some $15, $20 bulb just because it's sitting in a pet store. We're all about saving people money as well. So as long as this thing produces heat, but let's talk about the temperature. Temperature should be 105 degree basking spot, give or take a few degrees. I mean, it can fluctuate, it always does. And within the 80 degree range on your cool side. So 80s to the 105 basking spot only, okay? So your basking spot where the lamp is directly putting the heat to is where you want it to be about 105 degrees, okay? Um, when we start talking about diet inside of uh, 
um, inside of the bearded dragon. These guys are omnivorous as well as insectivorous, okay? So they, yes, eat all kinds of different insects. They eat fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and they will also eat some meat products. Uh, they will take pinkies, uh, rat pinkies, mice pinkies. Uh, when they're big enough, yes, they could even take rabbit pinkies, things like that. Um, so they will eat certain meat products, okay? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It shouldn't be done every single day. They become obese, um, shorten lifespan. There's a lot of bad that could happen. It's kind of like anything else. Too much, you know, too much of, of one thing can be a bad thing. Um, but with that being said, the primary diet uh, that is generally generally thought to be a consistent thing would be things like superworms, dubia roaches. Um, you can do uh, bugs such as your tomato horn worms, your phoenix worms, your butter worms, your wax worms, stuff like that. Uh, And some of that needs to be within reason. It doesn't need to be an every, everyday consistency uh, like the hornworms and, and the butterworms and some of those because it's got a little bit more nutritional content, kind of like pinkies. You don't want to do that every single day. Crickets, absolute no-no. Do not do crickets. You do not want to do the crickets for one thing. They're low nutrition. They're trash food. Number two, they cause intestinal parasites in reptiles. We see that and deal with those issues all the time helping people out uh, because crickets go around re-ingesting their own feces so that ends up causing tapeworms and pinworms and other uh, GI tract uh, microorganisms, okay? So it just, it's a bad thing. And it takes a lot of the crickets to actually fill them up where a few superworms or a few dubia roaches, it, it's gonna fill them up. High protein, high fat, um, good nutritional content. Now, we're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables. You can do a wide array of fresh fruits and vegetables. You can do anything from spinach within reason you don't want to do spinach all the time you don't want to do um, you don't want to do other things like broccoli um, and stuff like that all the time it's it's a variety uh, but you can do cabbage and collards and kale um, you can do uh, any of the bean family again it's high protein you don't want to do it all that often it would just be something for every once in a while um, you can do a little bit of lettuce but you got to remember lettuce is not nutritional it's a watery it's a watery vegetable okay um, but you don't want to do lettuce solely uh, you want to do that kind of mixed in. If you do like a spring mix or something like that, then okay, fine, so be it. And then if you mix some fruits in there with it, some chopped up, most dragons love the color red. Strawberries, tomatoes, uh, they like cucumbers and squash, and you can do things like watermelon and cantaloupe, and you can do grapes, you can do blackberries, uh, you can do apple slices, bananas. Uh, the sky's the limits. The only thing you don't want to do is absolutely no citrus of any form, okay? Way too much acidity. Um, so again, whenever you do your fresh fruits and vegetables, just do a mixture of stuff, okay? Just finely chopped up. That way it's easy for them to eat. With lizards, any kind of a lizard, when we're talking about feeding, if it can fit between their eyes, if you know that it can fit right between the eyes, then the lizard can safely take it down and it's not gonna hurt them, choke them, or anything else, okay? So as long as with the bearded dragon, or the water dragon, or the iguana, or anything else, as long as it can fit between the eyes, they can physically take it down without having complications, okay? Um, now, in the diet, when we start talking calcium with the vitamin D3, the powder, the calcium powder, nine times out of 10, we don't do that on our bugs. I know a lot of people will actually do the calcium powder with their bugs. We tend not to because the calcium powder doesn't stay on the bugs as easily. Most of the time, what we'll do is we'll do our calcium spread on the fruits and vegetables because it sticks to the watery fruits and vegetables a whole lot easier than it will the bugs. Um, the, the diet that we pretty much put everybody on, zoos, vets, uh, private individuals, whoever it is, whatever it is, whenever they're calling for consultation, is Monday, Wednesday, Friday is your feeder days. Tuesday, Thursday, and the weekend would be your fresh fruits and vegetables days. On their feeder days, if you want to give them a little bit of fresh fruit and vegetable, uh, that's perfectly fine. Because remember, everything within reason. Um, we're not going to just give them dozens and dozens of roaches. Um, it's going to be too much food. They're going to become obese. Uh, or they may just go to waste. Um, we're not going to give them uh, too much vegetables without some of the insects because then they're not going to get some of that proteiny uh, complex that they need from the bugs uh, that does help them grow. So again, we don't want to feed too much of anything, uh, 
Uh, and it's going to depend on the size of your dragon and what you're feeding as to what that is. So that's not something we can really cover, uh, you know, of course, in just a simple video because that's up to each individual situation. And each dragon has its own personality. Some of them will eat more if you let them. Some of them won't eat as much as, uh, you know, whether you wanted them to or not. All right. So ultimately, you have to know your dragon and know what it's, you know, what it's wanting to do or what it's going to do. Uh, but when we come, when it comes to the diet, nine times out of ten, we're going to do like a Tuesday, Saturday kind of a routine a little bit of a calcium spread, a little bit of a dusting uh, on the fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, that way they get that twice a week um, along with the UV exposure and with uh, the heat exposure. So you don't want to do too much calcium. Um, too much calcium along with the UV can actually cause problems as well. Uh, so too much calcium, bad thing. Not enough calcium, bad thing. Okay. Uh, when we start talking um, things such as cohabbing dragons and some people ask about cohabbing dragons yes you can cohab dragons but it really depends on each individual situation before you just start throwing dragons together yeah you need to know if one is is healthy there needs to be a quarantining period even in a breeding situation you don't want to just instantly throw animals together uh, yeah they live together in the wild they do perfectly fine in the wild yes they can do perfectly fine in captivity two males is not a good idea to put together just as a general rule of thumb with anything just for the simple fact that they may end up fighting uh, territorial uh, mating aggression whatever the case may be but generally speaking even your females are going to establish and bearded dragons will establish a hierarchy you'll have a dominant female you'll have subordinate females you know with a male female um, a male female grouping you're going to have a male dominant nine times out of ten and you'll have female subordinates sometimes you'll have a female dominant even even with a male in there it does tend to happen um, every once in a while but when it comes to housing multiples together they tend to do better if they grow up together or if they were housed together to begin with versus trying to take and just introduce a couple of adults and just throwing them into the mix um, again, some of them get along and some of them fight. Um, so it's going to be based off of each individual's personality and what they decide they want to do. Okay. Now, all right. So when we're talking the bearded dragon is just a pet, they get the name bearded dragon because they'll turn their throat black, just like a beard. And most of the time, that's one of two reasons either mating, he's trying to show off for the female or he's trying to threaten a male that he sees, um, or something's got him really stressed out. So that would be the three main reasons, the two key reasons. But if you have a single individual um, that, uh, that is by himself and there's no other females, there's no other males, then he's something stressing him out or really pissing him off. Okay. Now with these guys right here, they're very alert. Okay? They'll turn their heads and cock them side to side and up and down and, and they'll, be, they'll be alert and looking around, especially uh, a very healthy specimen like this guy right here. Um, you can trim their nails. Uh, it's called tipping them. You can you can tip those toenails because they the toenails do get uh, a little bit sharp. Uh, if you're not sure, if you're not comfortable about doing it, then certainly don't find somebody that, that knows how to do that for you. Uh, yes, they do have teeth. People ask us all the time, and yes, they are sharp teeth. Uh, they have a pretty hard little bite when they want to. They have to be able to crunch the bugs and, and, and things like that. So yes, they do have teeth. As far as their anatomy, of course, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, their eardrums, they have an external eardrum. Their ears are on both sides of the head right there. These are called fat pads, okay? What we have right here is something that will also help you to know when you're looking to know if the dragon is healthy, if there are fat pads right here, or if there's any hip structure. If there's no hip structure, they got nice chunky legs like this guy does right here. <laughs> he's getting very active. He's ready to go explore. But as long as he's got good fat pads going on right here, and he's got uh, a good a good thick, there's no it's not bony, and he's got meaty legs like this guy does right here. And see you see how he's pancaking out. Um, that's a good healthy specimen. That's something that you that you want to make sure that you look out for. Um, when it comes to MBD, um, they they could have like I said, watch the uh, watch the episode on MBD. But a crinkled tail could have messed up spine, crooked limbs, um, could have an underbite. Hey, stop it. <laughs> that's not food. Um, they could have an underbite that comes out. Um, there's, there's any number of things to be looking out for with issues like that. Now, one of the other main things is to make sure that he's actually alert. 
Uh, dragons with issues will sit real listless. Uh, they'll be very, very lazy looking. Um, that doesn't mean just because you walk into a store and you see a dragon and he's just laying there. It, it, it could be fun. They, they could be relaxing. Um, another thing that, that dragons will do also at the same time whenever they're basking in the sunlight is remember, they'll sit there with their mouth open, kind of like a crocodilian when they start getting too hot. Um, what they'll do is they'll actually open their mouth to help thermoregulate their brains so their brains don't overheat. Um, so whenever they're sitting there, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh crap, my bearded dragon's got a respiratory infection. No, he may actually just be sitting there and just be refusing to come out from under the heat because he's enjoying the heat. So he wants to just make sure that he doesn't cook his brain so he's just thermoregulating his body temperature. He's just sitting there under the light with his mouth just wide open, just sitting there, okay? Now, this is a good... This is an oh, now, now this is an overview of bearded dragons as captive pets. These guys do absolutely make a fantastic, awesome, awesome pet. They make a great companion animal. They're really, really easy to care for as long as you do it the right way. Okay, as long as you take the time to care for them the way that they need, and it's not complicated. They're so, so simple. And that's why there's so many of them out there. Unfortunately, not all are taken care of the way that they're supposed to. Uh, but as long as you take the time to really, uh, really get their habitat set up right, make sure their diet is really good, and just give them the attention they need, you're not going to find any kind of a better pet. Uh, these animals are absolutely, absolutely amazing. Yeah, so this is Chad with the Reptile Rangers at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo. We hope you enjoyed this. Just like any other time, write us in. People do it all the time. Let us know what you want to hear about. Let us know what you want to see. Let us know what you want to film, what you want us to film about, okay? We'll either see you at the zoo or we'll see you on the next episode. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to share these away. We'll see you next time.